I'm Holly Lynn Lee, and I'm here with our expert panel. I've got Chris, Roger, and Marianne with me, and we're going to focus on um, thinking about inferential reasoning in context where um, we're trying to decide which model is the most plausible for a given situation or for describing a population. So I'm actually going to start this time and kind of describe one of my favorite tasks that I initially designed with a colleague of mine, James Tarr, when we were working with middle school students. And um, this was kind of, it kind of came at the end of um, a two and a half week unit. And um, it's called the Schoolopoly task, but so we had a context where this, the school wanted to create their own game of Monopoly um, for their school and they wanted to um, make sure that they had dye that were fair for the game and there were rumors that certain dye companies were not producing fair dye um, and so they needed to do some investigation on these dye companies and they had to then decide as a class among these six dye companies which dye companies should they choose to um, purchase their dye from. So there was a real world um, context that they had to um, make a decision about. So they were kind of vested in this. And they were, each, each group of um, kids are given a dye company to investigate that have varying underlying probability models for the different outcomes. Um, and they have to decide, do they believe their dye is fair or not? And um, you know they have to, it's free choice where they have to decide their sample size and we they've had some real experiences with dye and I actually own um, dodgy dye that are that look real but aren't um, aren't fair and so they've had some experience with uh, some physical dye that actually don't behave um, in equiprobable ways and um, but we're doing this investigation on the computer and they have free choice about sample size that's been a, a key concept that we've talked about um, coming up in this and they have to collect their data and present evidence to, to make a claim do they think that the dye sent to them by their company is fair or not and, and come up with a plausible plausible model for that so that's one of my favorite tasks yeah. So I'd like to hear some about your favorite task when thinking about deciding between two kind of competing models, two or more competing models. Well, the one that I was going to describe is uh, one that we would actually use at the high school level, uh -huh. but it's a task that I could actually begin at the middle school level and then we grow and evolve with the task okay. until we get to the high school level. But one of the areas that I find my students struggle with and the teachers that I work with is working with categorical data. Yes. And absolutely. especially when they're working with contingency tables and trying to look at the questions of association between two categorical data. Mm -hmm. It's just something that hasn't been in their curriculum. It's something that we don't do enough of, I think, right. in our introductory statistics courses. So one of my favorite tasks and the scenario I probably use the most often is the famous dolphin therapy task. Yes. But it doesn't have to be the dolphin therapy task, uh, I, I, especially if you can find experimental situations. Mm -hmm. And this fits up nicely with the common core standard at the high school level about comparing two treatments. Right. And so this task works really well. Um, but if we talk about the dolphin therapy task, you've got two treatment groups, those that swim with the dolphins and those that don't and you're looking at does it improve their depression right and so you, you've got these two categorical variables so what I initially do with the task is talk, talk about how would we try to look to see if there is an association or if there's a difference in the two two treatment groups descriptively mm -hmm. which is at middle school this yeah. is eighth grade middle mm -hmm. school and this is where you're getting into conditional proportions and marginal proportions and the idea of do you have independence so you're, nice. you're kind of leaving eighth grade and you notice that the two conditionals are not the same. You talk about the relationship of the conditionals to the marginal, if there is independence versus no independence. Mm -hmm. But then once you get to the high school level, you're at that question, well, is this difference meaningful? Right. How, how do we really make an inference and how do we decide if it's statistically significant? And this is where you take on the simulation. Now, if you were in an introductory SAT course and you were doing the traditional inference, you'd think about using chi-square test or maybe Fisher's exact test and, and going and doing that, but we're, we're, not, we're not there. We're gonna do this with simulation. Mm -hmm. So we've got to think about how do we simulate this? How do we model this? Right. And I, I have found that that's a really powerful task for the students to discuss among themselves to try to reason 
how would we model the situation? Mm -hmm. And how do we model the randomization? How do we model the random assignment? What tool do I have available to me that could help me model this? Right. And typically what we end up using is a deck of cards, mm -hmm. you know, playing cards. And they think about how to set up the simulation and then actually carry out the simulation and uh, think about, well, what, what's my statistic here? What is it that I want to really look at? And then, of course, they end up creating a sampling distribution, a simulated mm -hmm. sampling distribution, yeah. and they get to that inferential piece. So um, I yeah. think the whole idea of helping teachers and students both understand how to set up these simulations, these models mm -hmm. that they're using, uh, they don't need to know anything formally about probability distributions and just powerful concepts that you have here. What, yeah. What's your null? What's your alternative? The idea of simulating p-values and conceptually understanding how to use them, how to interpret them. Right, right. So a couple of notes on that. So I have used the dolphin therapy task um, in my work with teachers, and I've not done the beginning piece mm -hmm. um, that you were talking about. We've kind of gone into, all right, here's the situation, and then how would we model this mm -hmm. through a simulation? And I think one of the first stumbling blocks that I often see is um, in thinking about doing a, a um, re-random assignment to, mm -hmm. to whether which treatment group you're in and having to make sure that um, the condition that someone's going to improve um, their depression no matter what well, group exactly they're right. in and that's like a real I think that's a, the first stumbling block that I see um, the, uh, the, the teachers that I've worked with come come to in that task of well, well what do you mean you know, <laughs> like they're gonna improve right. no matter what I'm like that's one of the assumptions in kind of building up the simulations mm -hmm. that you're going to assume it doesn't matter which group you got assigned to that this you is would, how many people are going to improve right this is how many right. people are going to improve you know and so your improvement level stays the same but which group you're in might change mm -hmm. you know and um, so I think that but at the other end when we get to looking at that um, sampling distribution and the empirical mm -hmm. p-value I have so many teachers that are like oh that's what that means well I think another important piece here and, and uh, that that I will talk about with this idea of modeling is how important it is to do the hands-on. Yeah, I agree. I, 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 and I'll share a story from a cl my class with teachers that I taught last fall. Um, had an experienced AP statistics teacher that was in the course. Wonderful teacher. And we were actually carrying out this activity in class with the cards. And he just, for the first time, I understand what we mean by random assignment. Yeah. And he, yeah. And he made the comment, he said, I've been teaching this, I've been having my students model yeah. using technology, and they had never gone through the hands-on right. aspect of it. And it was a light bulb moment for him as a teacher right. who's right. teaching this material yeah. uh, as to, to what's happening. And I think that's what's so powerful about simulation mm -hmm. is it's that visualization piece. It's the, the students are feeling the physical cards right. as, and, as opposed to pushing a button. Now, of course, you move to the technology, hopefully, once they have that conceptual understanding. Right. Because you want to do many reassignments. Many, you want to do right. it many, many, many times. Right. And, look at and trying to help them understand that what they're creating are permutations. Right. The different permutations that can happen under the random chance model where we do have this many people that are going to improve right. regardless of which treatment group they go in. Right, right, right. So, right. Um, so the first model they're, they're considering is the random chance model. That's exactly, that they are simulating the random chance model right, right. and seeing all the different permutations that they could get for that contingency table. And yeah. building up that distribution and of building, what, what that measure could look that's like. That's exactly right. right. And then where does the actual value fall right. that's in right. that distribution and is it something that's unusual? That's right. 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 So, do you want to tell us about your favorite task? Oh, uh, uh, Chris has kind of uh, alluded to some of the permutation stuff. I do one that's very similar, but it's with uh, continuous data, and it's uh, exam scores on two different colors mm -hmm. of exams. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you do the random assignment, and like you were saying, you have to think about this idea of the student's going to get the score on the exam regardless of which version of the exam they yeah. have. Yeah. So if they're a person who gets a 71, they would get that 71 if no they were taking what. version A or version B. And then talking to them and, and doing that physical hands-on 
let's take these people and, and re-randomize them to the mm -hmm. different groups and seeing that process before you go into the technology. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's true of any any of our applet kind of technology that we ha are seeing so many of that, that do such great things for us. But it's so easy for a student to look at that and say, okay, fine. Fine. But unless they really try it out by hand first mm -hmm. and really understand what the technology is doing, right. it really is something that can go right past them and they really don't have a fundamental understanding. Of yeah, things. yeah. And whenever I'm doing those kinds of activities, we will plot several by hand mm -hmm. on the board yes. um, of those results before we right. go to the technology so they can see, okay, the technology is just going to do more of what we just did right. and quicker than what we just did, right. but it, but we've already started building like on a physical dot plot right. of that. And thing. then you can match up, okay, in the technology, this, this place is one of those dots that you have on the board. Right. This is the uh, random assignment of the groups and so forth, right? Yeah, nice. And really matching up those pieces. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Mary Ann? Well, I, I thought of another activity, so I'm just going to mention it because maybe okay. people can access it. Uh -huh. um, I won't describe it in detail, but it's in uh, Navigations. Uh, I think it's the grades 9 through 12, Discrimination or Not activities. Yes. So if people have access yeah. to that, yeah. you wrote that, <laughs> that, that is so, so good and I so powerful. That. I love that. We've had yeah. te teachers modify it mm -hmm. well, with a different context instead of bank supervisors uh, being athletes getting into uh, the National Honor Society. Mm -hmm. So does being an athlete That's give you a uh, preference? Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I think um, in terms of, I was trying to think of a middle school activity, uh, just the color of m and so is one, and we, we collect data, uh, it's called How Sweet, The Sweet Task, and I think it's on the STU website. And uh, you collect data on the color of M&Ms and Skittles, and it turns out Skittle colors are uniform distribution, so they're all the same. Um, supposedly. Supposedly, but <laughs> it works out, you know, usually that they are. M&M color distribution is not uniform. Yeah, so there's, I don't know exactly what the percentages are, but it's definitely not the same. So we ask students what their favorite color M&M and Skittle is, and what do they think the most common colors are? And they have lots of opinions about these colors. They think brown and orange M&Ms are the common ones, and they're not. You know, it's, it's actually their favorite colors that are the most common, usually green and blue. Um, but Skittles are all the same. And so you collect all this data, and there, there also are some opportunities for joint and joint uh, probabilities and marginal probabilities, and so some of the things, uh, Chris, you were talking mm -hmm. about. Yeah. Uh, so there's, it's, a probability emphasis throughout, but at the end, um, you can aggregate all the class data and say, you know, so do we think the M and M colors are the same? Does M and M Mars, I think it's Mars Company, um, manufacture the same amount of blues and greens and browns? And you have, as a c comparison, you have the skill data at the mm -hmm. classroom level, and you can compare, you right. know, and say, do we think um, you know, do we think the M&Ms are the same amount of colors are being manufactured versus skills? And, um, you know, so I think it's it's a good lesson for getting at mm -hmm. comparing distributions. Uh, mm -hmm. so. And you get to eat candy at the end of the And you get to eat the candy. Of course. Yeah, Where's usually the before the end because yes. people can't wait. Although goldfish yes. that were marked on, we should not eat. No, of course. <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah. Very good. Yeah. Very good. All right. Thank you very much.